Church family, that song reminds me of why we exist. And we are not a social club. We are not just a legacy building with people who meet on a Sunday. We are a church. We are the people of God, the expression of Jesus Christ here in Anaheim. We are a part of the people whom God has redeemed across this entire world. And what a privilege and joy to be singing and going to the Word at the same time as all of our brothers and sisters in all of the churches across the area. By God's grace, we exist to worship Jesus Christ. And we are in such an exciting season of ministry here at Knott Avenue Christian Church because we've got a lot to be thankful for. I just think about the recent past and the kinds of things that God has done among the people here at Knott Avenue Christian Church. I think about yesterday when there were over 70 men who gathered in this room to raise their voices to Jesus Christ and to dis- sorry, discern what it means to be ready for the battle of this world. I think about all of the baptisms that we have had since January, and you know what? We've got two more later today in the second service. So after this, go get lunch, come on back somewhere right around noon and celebrate two more people who say, I want to publicly declare that I have died to the old life and I am risen with Christ. I think about all of the things that God is doing among us. I didn't ask for permission to, you know, call him out, but I think about James back in the sound booth, man, dealing with a foot injury for months, and now he's back serving. I mean, from the small things to the big things, God is doing amazing things. On average, our Sunday attendance is over 800. I mean, it's like we could not possibly attribute this to any human. Man, you look at our staff and you're like, yeah, not on their watch. Give me a break, man. Schmucks, sinners saved by grace. But by God's grace, Jesus is the pastor of this church, you know? I think about the incredible things we've got coming up. And I want to have like a little commercial right now that's also connected to what we're doing. This month, next month, and August, one Sunday each month, we are going to be gathering together, not in two separate services, but in one service. The first of those is on June 16th. That is Father's Day. The second one on July 21st, and the next one on August 18th. And I really want to hammer this home to the first service crowd. (laughs) Because can, can we just put our cards on the table? This is going to be a total inconvenience for you. I get it. Here's what we're doing. We will not have a 9 a.m. service on those three days. Our entire church, both of our English services and our Spanish service, one church, two languages, all together in this building at 11 a.m. And let me tell you why these three dates are so important to us. On Father's Day, our morning worship service is going to be an ordination service for three of our staff members. Pastor Albert, our student ministries pastor, Pastor Alejandro, our Spanish language pastor, and Alec, the good-looking dude you saw on the guitar. All three called the pastoral ministry. Two of our pastors already have never been ordained. Alec coming up among them as well. We are going to gather as an entire church and celebrate that God has given us faithful people to carry the gospel forward. Guys, I'm just saying, straight up, real talk, if you are just used to church at 9 a.m., it's going to be a total inconvenience to your schedule. But I'm also telling you, it'll be so worth it to have our entire church together praising Jesus for what he's done. On July 21st, That's our summer bash. That is where many of our children are going to lead us in worship that day. Our kids are not the church of the future. They are the church of today, my friends. And it's going to be a really cool opportunity. We're also going to party afterwards. We're going to have water games for kids. It's going to be a celebration in the summer. And then on August 18th, I really think that this will be the last opportunity we have as a church family, maybe ever, to all gather into this building because we're going to be pushing the seating limit. But that is going to be the day, the first day when our Spanish service kicks off at its 11 o'clock slot. They've been meeting later in the afternoon, which has been really hard for the community. But converting the fellowship hall to the chapel, bringing them to 11 o'clock, man, can you imagine simultaneously two languages praising Jesus Christ? 
August 18th is our fall kickoff, and that's what we're going to do. I ask you to take a picture of this, put it in your phone, set your strategic reminders. Those three days, man, I'm just telling you, when we are all gathered together, it is going to be amazing. Jesus has built so much momentum into our recent experience. And so here's where we get into the message. Because we're seeing so many good things, the enemies of God have an invested stake in knocking us down. Where Jesus is at work, his enemies try twice as hard to derail the gospel effort. Over these next five weeks, we're entering into a new, new series. It's called Ecclesia. That is the Latin version of the Greek word for church. And we're going to be talking about five big picture things that are crucial for a healthy church. And the one we're getting into today is unity. Unity. I had the opportunity one time to speak to someone who was going to be a full-time missionary in Ethiopia with the largest mission agency in the history of Christianity. And he was telling me about his training. And his head trainer, a guy who had trained thousands of missionaries, told him that the two biggest reasons why missionaries and pastors wash out of ministry, do not end well, and leave their people. Unfortunately, number one is sexual immorality. Number two, personality conflicts. And you just think, like, man, what what can we do about this? Man, at not having a Christian church, that first one we take so seriously, man. We have accountability structures throughout the entirety of our leadership. We have background checks for anybody who's even in the ecosystem of our children's ministry. Like, we are a people who follow Jesus in holiness, and we do everything in our power to walk together with Jesus, straight up. And if you've got a better idea of how we can even do that better, let's do it. Sin dies in the light, but it festers in the darkness. We are a people of the light. So if the devil's not going to get us there because we're trying really hard, where else is he going to throw his slings and arrows? Where else is he going to send a flaming dart? Where else is he going to try to get the people of God? One of those places is in our unity, man. Because there are so many little things that can potentially disunify us because this world as a whole is disunified. I mean, just think of the media you have consumed just in the past 24 hours. I'm talking all social media, all TV, all news, all movies, all everything. Just think about the catalyst for division that we have seen in the last day of our lives. It's no wonder that this is such a big issue, man. And I'll tell you what, unfortunately, it's well documented in the church. When I was in seminary, I had to read a book called Great Church Fights. (laughs) can you believe it (laughs) can you believe that someone back in history sat down at a desk and wrote great church fights and wrote about dozens you read them and you're like are you kidding me there's a story in this book about this church where one person without asking for permission hung a coat hook on the back wall and there was a faction within the church that was angry that they hang it in the first place And the other faction was angry that they hung it on the right side of the door instead of the left side of the door. And this coat hook caused such a division that half of the people in this church left and built a building on the other side of the street and literally had a byline in their name about how they are not a people of the hook. Can you believe it? Now, now hold on for a sec, hold on for a sec, because one of our values is real talk before small talk, (laughs) and it is so easy to point fingers at that situation and say, you idiots. The biblical word for that would be moron, by the way. (laughs) But whenever we rightly look, perhaps in judgment, at a situation like that, we have to introspect. Man, what are the preferences that we have that are not Jesus that potentially rile us up in the way that that coat hook did to a different community? 
I'm not trying to be flippant here. I'm just saying, my friends, we've got something better. We've got the risen Lord Jesus Christ that unites us. And that's what we're looking at today. Grab your Bibles. We're going to be in the book of Philippians. In Philippians, starting in chapter 1, we're going to get the end of chapter 1, and then we're going to transition into chapter 2 because these two ideas are so linked. It's like this, this incredibly tightly wound dialogue that not only shows us what it means for the people of God to be unified to a major degree, but the actual basis for it. Man, I, I've said this before, but something that so impressed me when I was a young believer is that the Bible never tells you to do something without telling you why. Does that resonate with anybody else? Does anybody else get frustrated when someone says, you have to do this? And you're like, why? And they're like, because I said so. I hate that, man. I hate that. And I just, I feel like the Lord is so gentle with us because this indeed shows us what Jesus' followers should be like. But the rationale I think, makes it as clear as day. Let's get into the Word. We are in Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 27. Only let the manner of your life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to you or am absent, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you for the sake of Christ that you should not only believe in him, but should also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw that I had and now hear that I still have. So if there is any encouragement in Christ any comfort in love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others." Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." Therefore, God has highly exalted him above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This text, man, is, it's worth putting your ribbon in, is worth marking, is worth reading at length because of the depth with which it describes not only what a Christ-like demeanor looks like, but, but how we get there. How do we think about it? What is the foundation and the basis for our unity? And before we kind of dig into this, I, I, I just want to come clean, man. This is, this is not something that I have always done well. I am preaching as much to myself as I am to you. And I want to tell you real quickly the story of the closest I ever came to throwing hands on a church property. I was a young pastor, uh, uh, early 20s, trying to serve a church that was deeply wounded. I'll, I'll tell you that story later. But God was doing amazing things and bringing us amazing people. And then there was Zach. Okay. Zach came from a rough background. He had done about 15 years inside. He had some significant trauma in his life. But, man, God was working in his life, and it was really excited. But somehow, someway, he came to us just a total legalist, man. And, and he didn't like me at all. And anything I did, he wanted to do the opposite. 
He didn't like my preaching. He didn't like the way that I dressed. He didn't like the way that I acted. He didn't like the way that I served. He didn't like the way that I prayed. And he would come up to me and tell me how much he didn't like every one of those things. And you know what, my friends? I say this with all sincerity in the world. I think that we owe each other those hard conversations. I am not above criticism in any way. But I would have thought, perhaps in my naivety, dude, there's got to be something you like about me, but apparently there wasn't. Anybody who wasn't passionate about what he was passionate about probably didn't love Jesus, in his opinion. And so it was a hard situation, a hard situation. And as you can imagine, I had several run-ins. I'm trying to be patient. I'm trying to be merciful. He's testing my patience. And every time we have a conversation, I can just feel this tightness in my chest. And so all of a sudden, it's a Tuesday, and I get to church early, and I'm working on stuff, and I walk outside, and there's Zach, and he's pulling weeds by this little gazebo that we had. It's like our little welcome center. And I'm like, man, this is a great opportunity for me to go and to encourage Zach. And so I walk over to him, and I say, Zach, man, I am so grateful that you are here. Like, you're out here pulling weeds. It's what nobody else wants to do. Man, I'm just so encouraged by your faithful service. And he looks at me and he said, yeah, our worthless young adult should be doing this. And I just snapped. And I got in his face. And I said everything that I had been feeling for months. I'm like, you want to know why our young adults are not doing this? Because they have jobs unlike you, man. You're out here and blah, blah, and how dare you attack the people. I, and I mean, I just, I was hot, man. And he tried to puff up and I puffed up harder. And it was like, this is, this is that close, man. And all of a sudden I went, ah, and I pulled myself away and I walked away. And I took about 10 steps and I'm like, Joe, is that who you are? You really feel all those things, but is that what Jesus has called you to do as a pastor of this church? And so I had to go to Zach, and I had to eat humble pie, and I had to apologize to him. Not just as an obligation, but I really think as an expression of worship to Jesus Christ, you know, and we did solve our our relationship, and we did actually become somewhat of friends, and he still talks trash about me in that community, (laughs) you know, like for real. So I'm coming to you guys honestly and letting you know that I need this word. You know, I, I had a conversation about something totally different this week. What I have found experientially in life is when we don't think that a temptation is even a reality for us. We're actually so close to doing that thing. And we're so arrogant and blinded that we won't see it coming. So I'm hoping for some humility here, because that's the whole second half of this text. For us to say, hey, we have a divine call by Jesus Christ to be unified with one another. And maybe we haven't done that well in the past. That maybe we're not doing that well right now. But friends, let's walk together on this. Our big idea comes straight out of the text, and hopefully it kind of helps us encapsulate what we're talking about. Here's our big idea today. Side by side, we are unified in Christ. Side by side, we are unified in Christ. There's not just the theological component, we're unified in Christ, but there's the practical component. We do this shoulder to shoulder, arm to arm, sitting next to each other, serving next to each other. And this is what we see come through this text so powerfully, man. Paul transitions in verse 27 from a discussion where he's telling his audience, the Philippians, he's like, I don't know whether I would choose life or death. He's sitting in prison at the point. And it's very possible that execution is on the table. And what I love about the Apostle Paul as a biblical writer is he's so real. He's like, hey, they might kill me, they might not. And if I got to choose, I'm not sure which one I would choose because if I die, I get to go be with Christ today, man. But if I get to stay, I get to continue to serve you. He literally says, I don't know which one I would choose. And he uses his experience to teach the Philippians about what it means to follow Jesus. And here's where he gets in verse 27. 
Philippians 1.27 says, only let the manner of your life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Like, friends, we do have an obligation. Following Jesus and living for Jesus is the point. That's what we're called to do. That's what we're commanded to do. Let the manner of your life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then he says, in season and out of season, so that whether I come to you or am absent, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Can you imagine, let's, let's take ourselves back 2,000 years. Imagine that we are a first century church and an apostle walks in the door. <laughs> Can you imagine that that might be a nerve-wracking experience? It's like Jesus is using this dude to write 13 letters of the New Testament. Like, I I love the way that Paul says this, whether I come to you or I'm absent. Man, you don't need an apostle in the room. You don't need a pastor in the room. You don't need someone of authority in the room. I'm asking you to live for Jesus today. Whether I come to see you or am absent. And by the way, that's like the center section of that verse, right? The first section says, let your life be worthy of the gospel. So that whenever, whether I'm here or whether I'm there, and this is what it looks like. This is what a life that is worthy of the gospel looks like. I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. That phrase, one mind, is going to be used a couple more times in this dialogue. Unfortunately, sometimes people use that one-mindedness, I think, inappropriately to say that we are supposed to all be identical. One of the things I love the most about Not Avenue Christian Church is the fact that we're not. Man, we have so many different experiences. We have so many different perspectives on life. The diversity here is incredible in terms of life experience, where we come from, what we're thinking about. But the thing that brings us together, the one-mindedness that brings everybody into this room is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the one-mindedness. We are standing firm in one spirit, that we are of one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. For a short stint in my life, I played rugby. It was weird because I only got into it after I had graduated from college. But our rugby team at the university wasn't accredited in the same way that like an NCAA sport is. So as a faculty, I was able to sneak on the team. Not sure that was totally ethical, but whatever, right? So for a couple years, I played rugby. And rugby is a brutal sport, man. And I learned more than at any other time in my life what it means to strive side by side for something. Because when you're in the scrum, that's like that, it's almost like the football huddle, but it's like you got five dudes linking arms, neck and neck, slamming against each other. When you've got 12 sweaty guys trying to get this ball, it is crucial that you are striving side by side in the same direction with the same force, with the same ideology, and with the same goal in mind. Friends, our goal is to worship Jesus Christ. Our goal is to introduce our community to the Savior. Our goal, our focus, our vision is to do life together as the body of Christ and to make a difference in our community for Jesus. We can't do everything, but that thing we must do, especially in light of the fact that the world might not understand that. Look at our next verse. Verse 28 says, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. I don't know if this is 100% true. I need to go and look, and I probably should have gone and looked, but I have heard that the single most repeated command in scripture is do not fear. My my general feeling is that's probably true. 
but I don't like to say things I saw on Facebook without a fact check. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> we get in way too much trouble for, for posting stuff that we don't understand. But I'm just, I'm thinking through, I'm thinking Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, I'm thinking through the Old Testament, I'm thinking through the New Testament, and I'm thinking <clears throat> there's probably some there there. Perhaps the most repeated command in all of Scripture is do not fear. I think that means it's because sometimes we fear. <laughs> you think? And, and, and here's the double-edged sword. Like, look at verse 28. Not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign of their destruction. But if your salvation and that from God, it's almost as if Paul is saying, guys, why would you fight in this building when there are so many people fighting against you outside of this building? If you've got so much opposition in this world to the point where you might be afraid of it, man, th that is all the more reason that we act like a family and side by side be unified for Christ. Verse 29, though, we don't have a whole lot of time to unpack this today, but I think that this is crazy. For it has been granted to you that word granted could be translated gifted. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Think about the, the, the ground we've covered thus far. Paul started this by saying, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel so that whether I come or I'm absent, I'll hear of the fact that you are standing in one spirit, striving in one mind, or I'm standing in one spirit, that you are of one mind, that you're striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Not frightened by your opponents because we know that Jesus wins. He has already won. And it has been gifted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should believe in him. But also perhaps that you'll be given an opportunity to suffer for Jesus. Why, man, why? I mean, this cuts to the very heart of what people call the prosperity gospel. There's an entire movement out there that says, no, Jesus just wants you to be rich, beautiful, and happy. Can we possibly agree with that with a verse like this in ahead of us? You know, like, why does God grant his people perhaps the opportunity to suffer for his namesake? Man, because standing for Christ in the good times and in the bad times is a means by which we show the truth to this world. If we are identified with Christ, to identify with him in the joy of salvation, and dare I also say the joy of standing firm even when it's hard, then that is the Christian life. If we are divided, man, it's like we don't get to experience either of those things. Now, when we go into chapter 2, I think this is so strategic, man, because Paul's laid on us a pretty heavy reality. Man, be unified. And perhaps the astute reader is thinking about all the reasons whereby we might be disunified. Well, what about that person that votes differently than me? Well, what about that person that dresses differently than me? Well, what about this and what about that and what about all these things? Guys, all of these things are real things in the world, and I don't think we bury our head in the sand about these things. But we are a people of Jesus Christ. How do we navigate them? How do we navigate the hard conversations that are coming up this November? How do we live as real human beings in Southern California? You know, we have a responsibility, man, to apply our faith, not just on this property, but whether they come or whether they go, wherever we find ourselves. 
Paul links the idea of unity with the crucial concept of humility. Check this out. Chapter 2, verse 1 says, For if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in spirit, any (coughs) affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, he's bringing that idea back, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. You know, he said before, strive side by side, be of one mind. Now he's going to continue to tell us what that looks like. Verse 3, do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count one another more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Man, unity and humility. I think that these have to go hand in hand. If we are an arrogant people, like like just real question, my friends, if we are an arrogant people, will we be unified? I doubt it, man. So how can we be unified? By living as a humble people. I have told you before a thousand times, man, that this is also something that is so convicting to me because I know that at the depth of my heart, I am a viciously prideful person. I wake up in the morning and my head immediately begins to swell with my ego. And each day is a fight to say, you belong to Jesus Christ, you are not your own. And so when I hear, I need to be humble, I want to know why. Can I just be honest with you? When the text is so compellingly say, be humble, I want to know why. The why is extraordinary. Look at verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Why must we be a humble people? Because we have a humble Savior. Like, here's the real deal. If Jesus is humble, what right do I have to be arrogant? Look at the way that this is explained. Let's get verse 5 again for context. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient even to the point of death, death on a cross. Man, the the kind of technical theological word that theologians use to describe this right here is the great condescension. When we use the word condescend, we're usually talking about speech, like I'm talking down to you, right? Right? But, but that's kind of what the word means, right? Like you're talking down to someone. Like, here's the crazy thing. When you're riding in an elevator going downward, you are condescending. <laughs> that would be a weird elevator. Like you got that 45 seconds to talk to your new friend in the elevator. Hey, I'm glad to condescend with you right now. <laughs> yeah, maybe not so much of a friend after. Think about the, con- if condescension means to go down, think about the sense in which Jesus Christ, God himself, the one who said, let there be light, becomes a human. The great condescension. The greatest demonstration of humility. If God himself shows us what humility looks like, what right do we have to be arrogant? And if we have no right to be arrogant, in our self-sacrifice, man, we can be unified. Because we hold strong opinions about a variety of things. About sports and about cars and about society and civics and all the rest. 
But the thing that brings us together is Jesus, the exalted Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 9. Therefore, God has exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Friends, if that is our battle cry, if that is our hymn, if that is our song, if that is our saying, if that is our creed, Jesus Christ exalted above the heavens, the name above every other name, the one who saves, the one who gives our lives meaning and context, the ones who binds us together as brothers and sisters. If this Lord Jesus is our anthem, we will side by side be unified in Christ. Because there is most definitely a hierarchy of importance here. And if Jesus is first, man, everything flows from that point of reference. I am so excited about the future of Not Avenue Christian Church. And I truly believe, I'm not just saying this, that our best days are ahead. God has done amazing things through this people since the early 1950s, and he is not done with us yet. And if we are a people who are united by Jesus Christ, man, the gates of hell tremble at our approach because we follow our pastor, Jesus, the name that is above every name. I'm going to invite our band back up on stage as we rest under the weight of this significant thing. My friends, side by side, we are unified in Christ. And I feel it incumbent to say a couple things, you know, given the illustrations that I've used, don't be afraid to complain to me. <laughs> you know, I, I, I didn't throw that in there as like this, this secret underhanded thing, right? No, like we're in this together, guys. Our best is getting better. If we don't live out the real talk that we owe to one another, I don't think we're going to grow, either personally or as a whole. But straight up, and I'm, I'm not mincing words here, if you have something against me, or if I have something against you, or if you have something against him, or if you have something against her, we owe them love before we owe them criticism, before we owe them disunity, before we owe them aggression. And I'm telling you straight up, I have not always lived that well, and I told you one such story. But my friends, if there is any affection and sympathy and comfort and love, we must be of the same mind, unified in Jesus Christ. Here now we're going to have an opportunity to sing a song, I think that really beautifully encapsulates this. This song is called Hymn of Heaven. We long to sing the hymn of heaven. We long to stand in the assembly of the saints and the angels at the throne of God. But we can sing that hymn of heaven today. And I'm telling you straight up, if God is working on your life, if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and you want to be a part of this unified body, man, this hymn of heaven is speaking to you today. If you've got a decision to make for Jesus, I invite you to make it. Let me pray. Father, we just thank you so much for your word, the way it pierces to the soul. I just thank you, God, for the way that you have organized the people at Not Avenue Christian Church. And I just pray, Lord, that you continue to shape us in the image of your son as we pursue the gospel side by side, united in Christ. A humble people who are bold and fearless because Jesus goes before us. Lord, I pray that you would guide us and indwell our very voices as we sing. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Church family, stand with me as we sing.